Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jillian Kemsley, a senior editor at CNEN, and I will be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled Charge It, Electrophoretic Mobility is a Tool for Characterizing Nanoparticle Stability. It is sponsored by Wyatt Technology. CNEN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNEN's audience and consistent with CNEN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You are encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. As your moderator, I will pose as many as time permits. Please note that CNEN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in the webinars. Each webinar will be archived at CNEN online after the live webcast. Today's presentation is sponsored by Wyatt Technology. Wyatt manufactures light scattering instrumentation and develops software for determining absolute molar mass, size, charge, and interactions of macromolecules and nanoparticles in solution. Applications include inline multi-angle static light scattering, field flow fractionation, composition gradients for interaction analysis, high throughput dynamic light scattering, high sensitivity electrophoretic mobility, differential refractometry, and differential viscosity. During the presentation today, we will hear from Stephen Trainoff, R&D Chief Scientist at Wyatt. He has a PhD in experimental physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he worked on nonlinear dynamics of pattern forming systems. He has directed Wyatt's engineering and manufacturing activities for the last 15 years, and he is active in ongoing instrument development and key research programs. He holds several key patents on analytical instrumentation design, and in 2010, he was elected a Fellow of the American Physical Society. I will now hand the presentation over to Steve. I'm Steve Trainoff, and I'm going to be speaking today about electrophoretic mobility measurement of proteins and nanoparticles, and I'm the Chief Scientist at Wyatt Technology Corporation. So a brief outline of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm going to talk about mobility and why you should care about it, uh, a little bit about how it's measured in free solution. And although there's a lot of literature and instruments that have measured colloids and large particles that go back many years, I'm going to talk a little bit about why proteins and nanoparticles are particularly difficult and how you can measure them reliably. I'll talk a little bit about um, the issue of what happens when you have high salt in the buffers. and automation. And then I'll move on to some case studies, talk about how people have used mobility detection to solve some real problems. So the two that I'm going to talk about are heparin conjugates and immunogenicity and aluminum nanoparticles that are used as vaccine edgements. Now, one word of caution, I'm a physicist and I know more about the technology than I know about the applications, so you might get a little idiosyncratic view of the applications. And then I'm going to talk about something that's really exciting, a brand new application of mobility measurement, the ability to couple online uh, size exclusion chromatography and field flow fractionation to uh, mobility detection. And this is a new application that's never been done before. Okay, so let's talk at the beginning, mobility. So mobility is the measurement of the motion of charged particles in solution. So the experiment in principle is very simple. You take a fluid sample and you apply an electric field. In this case, it's shown by the battery that puts a positive electrode on the left and a negative electrode on the right. The particles that are in solution that are charged feel the field and they start to move. Then there's an interplay between the field that's driving them from one electrode to the other and a frictional force that's slowing them down. So they reach a terminal velocity. In this case, it's called V. And the mobility is simply the ratio of the terminal velocity to the applied field. So if the particles are positively charged, the mobility is positive. If the particles are not charged at all, the mobility will be zero. And if the particles are negative, it will actually move in the opposite direction of the field, and the mobility will be negative. Just to give you a sense of scale, the fields that one applies are roughly around 10 volts per centimeter, and the resulting velocities that develop are around 10 micrometers per second. So these are very slowed motions on top of uh, the fluid motion that could occur from other sources. So why does anyone care about mobility? 
as I mentioned before, there's a long history of measuring the mobility of colloids and particle suspension. And it's related to this concept of the zeta potential. And so in this diagram, I'm showing a positively charged uh, particle, and it attracts ions from the solution. And there are some ions that are so strongly attracted, they are essentially bound onto the surface. And there's other charges in the solution that are not bound. And if you measure the voltage with a little test particle, and you start right at the surface, and you move that test particle away, and measure the voltage as you move out, the voltage right at the slip plane where you go between the bound charges and the free charges, that voltage is the zeta potential. And it's a very well-defined concept in colloid stability, and it's often used to determine whether or not something is going to stay in solution. The example that I like to give people is, let's say you're making paint, and the, you want the pigment particles to stay in solution until you paint it on a wall and the solvent evaporates. Well, one way to do that is you modify the surface chemistry of the particles to make them highly charged, and then they all repel, and so they don't want to stick together. And so as long as they're all highly charged, the, the solution will be stable. If, on the other hand, the charge were to go away, they can stick together and they can flocculate. So this is a well-defined concept from colloids and particles. I'm going to concentrate today a little bit more on molecular uh, solutions, both from proteins and nanoparticles. And the concepts are very similar, but they're a little different because the ions can interpenetrate inside the molecule, you can get selective binding, but the same concepts of using molecular charge as a measure or as a determination of whether or not something is going to be stable or not, that also applies. And you can also use this to measure the isoelectric point, and that's the point at which the surface charge goes to zero. In this case, we would see the mobility go to zero. Okay, so how do you measure it? Well, there's many techniques, and the one that we use is called phase analysis light scattering. And so we have, in this uh, diagram, a light source. In this case, it's a laser. It's shown by the red arrow that's, that's shining on a fluid sample, the particles that are between the two plates. The electric field is shown by the red and the blue plates. And the electric field is going to drive the particles up and down in this view, so the particles will move when I apply the electric field. Most of the light goes straight through, as indicated by the large red arrow on the right, but some of it will scatter off the particles and get redirected toward a detector. Now, there are techniques such as dynamic light scattering that are very sensitive to measuring particle motion, and a lot of people ask why you can't use dynamic light scattering to measure mobility. And although dynamic light scattering is a very sensitive tool for measuring very small changes, relative changes of positions of particles, if all the particles are moving together, then in fact there is no signal from dynamic light scattering. So it can't be used directly. But a modification called heterodyne scattering allows you to make a mobility measurement. And so this consists of taking some of the light and not sending it through the cell, sending it around the cell. This is represented by that blue bar that goes around the electrode. And then you interfere that light at the detector with the scattered light. And the basic idea is that when the particles move inside the electrodes, they will pick up a small Doppler shift. The light that goes around the cell does not get such a Doppler shift. And when you make the interference between these two lights, or these two beams, you'll get a term that's proportional to velocity. And in this case, what will happen is you'll get a series of fringes that'll sweep across the detector. And by measuring the rate at which these fringes sweep across the detector, you can measure how fast the molecules are moving. And that's all well and good. The problem is, when I change the field, I just reverse the field, the fringes will move in the other direction. But if I have a detector that's just looking at one location in space, I just see a sine wave with a given frequency, and I get exactly the same frequency if the particles are moving upwards as I get when they're moving downwards. So this technique, as I've drawn it, doesn't allow you to determine the sign, whether or not it's positive or negative. Fortunately, that's easily solved. You use a technique where you modulate the local oscillator. And what I mean by that is when there's no motion of the, of the particles that we're studying, because we've modulated the local oscillator, we're going to get fringes that sweep rapidly across the detector. And now when they move up, the frequency will slow down. And when they move down, it'll speed up. But now I can tell the difference between a little bit faster and a little bit slower, and I can disambiguate the up versus down problem. And that's the basic idea between phase analysis light scattering. And the nice thing about it is it's non-invasive. We're measuring the molecules in free solution. Now, of course, there are electrodes that are applying the field, but the probe is optical, and so we're not uh, changing the sample from the measurement. 
So like I said, there's a long history going back many years of people measuring particles in suspension, both uh, colloids and other particles. It gets a little bit more challenging when you try to look at proteins and nanoparticles. Let me give you an idea. Well, the first problem is they're much smaller, and so they don't scatter a lot of light. And that's not a huge impediment because the light sources that we have now are quite bright and you, you can collect the light. The bigger problem is that electrophoresis is not the only thing that's going on. There is, in addition to electrophoresis, there's diffusion. Now, the diffusion means that the particles are undergoing a random walk, and on top of that random walk, there is some net migration up or down. Now, the reason we can differentiate between these two effects is the diffusion averages to zero, whereas the migration does not. It goes up when the field is up, or perhaps the other direction, but it switches with the field. So I can uh, make a measurement, and by oscillating the field, both positive and negative, I can determine which component of the motion is changing with the field and what component is not. So the diffusion I can average away. But even so, historical instruments that were designed for measuring colloids typically had problems getting below about five nanometers in size. Now, that's quite small, but they went from maybe five nanometers up to tens of micrometers. And, but when they got on the low end, they needed very high concentrations, and they started running into problems. Okay, let me highlight what I'm talking about. So here is an example of big particles, either milk or paint. And I have on the vertical axis the average position of all the particles, and I have on the horizontal axis time. The beginning of it is when I have the field going up, and the second half is when I have the field going down. And you can see, because they're highly charged, there's mostly electrophoretic migration with a little bit of diffusion on top of it. If I look at multiple particles, they all pretty much do the same thing. But the key point is when the particles are large, most of the motion is due to electrophoresis with diffusion being a small modification on top of that. When you look at nanoparticles and molecules, the switch situation changes. It inverts. So now we're dominated by diffusion, and we have a small net migration on top of that. So now if I look at multiple realizations, they all have that underlying motion, but it's obscured by diffusion. Now if I were to average long enough or make many measurements, I would recover the underlying uh, motion that's shown by this black triangle, which moves with the field. But the fundamental problem, even if you have enough light, is diffusion is dominant over the mobility. Okay, so what have people done in the past? Well, one thing that they've tried doing is they've said, okay, just crank the concentration. That helps a lot when you have a weak signal. You can get more signal, but it doesn't really help with the diffusion problem. So another thing people have tried is if you increase the voltage, that makes them move more rapidly. And to that end, some people have used very high voltages, 50 to 100 volts. And as long as the electrodes are far away from where you're making your measurement, that works okay, but you have a problem, which is you start electrolyzing the, the solvent, and you evolve bubbles um, on the electrodes. If the electrodes are far away, you might say that's okay, but in fact, you still generate convection currents that can move the sample around, so bubbles are a problem. If you're trying to minimize the volume of sample that you're measuring, so you have a very small cell and you put the electrodes near where you're making your measurement, then those bubbles are going to be right in the middle of your measurement volume, and that's another problem. The other problem is, of course, you can damage your sample. You can literally burn the sample onto the electrodes, and then with the electrodes being coated, you don't even get the field in the, in the solution. So that's not a good solution. A better way is to integrate for a long time. As I mentioned, the diffusion integrates to zero. If I wait for a very long time, eventually the diffusion will disappear and I'll be left with just the net migration. But even when you do that, you're slowly degrading the samples. So you can only integrate for so long. So the key observation is there's a great benefit for trying to make measurements rapidly with low fields. So I believe there's a better way. So this is what we've come up with, and this is an implementation of the PALS concept, it is an interferometer where there's light that comes in from the left. It travels the, along the bottom of this diagram through a series of lenses. It goes to the cell, which is in the bottom middle of the, of the uh, diagram. The light then gets collected by a lens, and then there's a, there is a, a mirror that reflects it upwards, and then it goes on to a beam splitter onto a detector. 
If you go back to the laser on the lower left, you'll see some of the light is split by a beam splitter. It's heads up. We have our modulator, that's a piezo that moves up and down, that, that makes the fringes sweep, and then it gets expanded, and then it's recombined at the beam splitter onto an array detector. Now, the key point is that by doing this in free space, every point on that array, every element on the array is like a separate independent measurement. And since we did a very, uh, what I'd like to think is a good job of collecting the scattered light, we can do 31 simultaneous channels in parallel. So it's like integrating for 31 times as long or having 31 instruments measuring the same sample at the same time. So that gives you a parallelism that allows you to beat down the diffusion and uncover the underlying mobility measurement. So this is the key point, is by using an array of inexpensive uh, photodiodes, we can have a large number of them. And also, the other nice thing about them is they have a very wide dynamic range so that we don't have to worry about going off scale. And you'll also notice in the middle of this diagram, there's a little uh, label called DLS. So we can simultaneously do dynamic light scattering, and that looks at the backward scattered light. We use the forward scattered light for the mobility. So we get both mobility and dynamic light scattering giving us the size simultaneously. So you get the speed from the parallelism, and you can do both these measurements at the same time. So that's what it looks like in cartoon format. This is what it looks like in the implementation. We have a laser, and we have two different lasers, either red or green, depending on whether or not your samples have absorptions or fluorescences that you're trying to stay away from. There is a piezoelectric modulator on the upper right. There is the photodiode array on the lower right. We temperature regulate the entire bench so you can make measurements from 4 degrees C to 70 degrees C. We have a removable flow cell, and what I mean by a flow cell is a cell that can be taken out and treated like a cuvette and filled and put in the instrument, or you can flow the sample through capillaries. And we have the backscattered dynamic light scatter. Let's talk about what it doesn't have. So we don't have an avalanche photodiode or a photomultiplier tube, which is what's typically used to measure the scattered light. We have an array of inexpensive detectors. We have no optical fibers. Well, that's not quite true. We have an optical fiber for the dynamic light scattering, but the phase analysis light scattering portion doesn't rely on optical fibers. And of course, we have no hardware correlator. We do all of this in software. The, the increase in computing means we have a, a million sample per second data acquisition card, and we have a very fast computer, and we can take the data and analyze it in real time. Um, we don't have to adjust the intensity of the unscattered, the uh, local oscillator to the scattered light, and that's because these detectors have a very wide dynamic range. We don't have to apply a high voltage. We have a fairly low sample volume between 40 microliters and 180 microliters, depending on which cell you use. And there's essentially no moving parts. Well, that's not quite true. There is a piezo, but it only moves about one quarter of a human hair. So it's a solid state, very robust measurement. So here's what the data looks like. So this is the data from uh, human antibody, IgG. It was at one milligram per milliliter um, with 20 millimolar sodium chloride. We applied three volts, and if you look at the right axis, that's the applied voltage. And for the first half the measurement, we're at plus three, and for the second half the measurement, we're at minus three. On the left axis, we have this parameter called the optical phase, but it's really the uh, net motion of the molecules. So when the field is positive, the particles move up, and you see the particles moving up, and then we change the field, they reverse direction, and they come back. And this is a result of 20 seconds worth of data integrated together. And from all of this, the slope of the optical phase is essentially measuring the velocity. So by measuring the velocity, we can determine the mobility because we know what field we put on it. So in this particular measurement, the, the mobility that we get is about 0.5. Now it has units of micrometers centimeter per volt second, because remember, it's the ratio of a velocity, which is micrometers per second, to an electric field, which is volts per centimeter. So we get this funny hybrid unit. I'm going to refer to it as MBU, or mobility units. But it's really micrometers centimeter per volt second. And because we simultaneously are measuring the size, we know that this molecule is 5.5 .5 nanometers. You can take it a step further. So this graph is a measure of a bunch of measurements, each at a different pH. So I have the pH running along the horizontal axis. 
I have the measured mobility measure uh, going along the vertical axis. And you can see at low pH, it's positively charged and it has a high mobility. At high pH, it's negatively charged and has uh, also a high negative mobility. And somewhere in between, it goes to zero. And that's the classical definition of the, the PI. So in this case, we've measured the PI of 9.15. Talk a little bit about high salt, because of course, many measurements you want to measure at physiological salt. So salt means you make a very high conductivity solution. High conductivity means when you apply that electric field, you put that battery across the salty solution, you get a lot of current. The current means two things. You can heat the sample and you can cause convection. And I showed this schematically here as a heating from the bottom and cooling from the top, causing the, the fluid to move independent of the mobility measurement that we're trying to make, the electrophoresis, you can get free convection of the of buoyancy driven flows. And what's worse is changing the field heats in both directions, so that doesn't go away by changing the field. And also, of course, you get a lot more bubbles when you have more current. The volume of bubbles uh, evolved depends on the, the current times time. And practically what this means is above for about 3 volts applied to the fluid sample, um, you have problems above about 75 millimolars of sodium chloride. Now, Physiological uh, solutions are 150 millimolar. So there's about half of physiological you start running into bubbles. So the state of the art in 1930, when Arnie Tosilius did the, the very first mobility measurements or measurements of electrophoresis of proteins, looked something like this. He had a cell, as shown on the lower right, and this is from his 1930 paper. Uh, I should point out he won the Nobel Prize for this work. Um, it had a large reservoir on the left where you put solvent, a large reservoir. Reservoir on the right, where you put the solvent, you put your protein or your particles in the little U right at the bottom, and he applied a big voltage. And they got net migration and separation of the proteins into bands. Now, this worked because the electrodes were very far away, and so even though he was electrolyzing the electrodes, he didn't, those bubbles were not interfering with the measurement, but he had problems with convection, and he had to put the entire instrument in a temperature controlled bath at four degrees C to try to make the thermal expansion zero, go to zero. But that worked in 1930. In 2015, we make the measurement in a small flow cell. In this flow cell, there's a fluid fitting that comes in from the top that brings the sample in, and there's another fluid fitting that takes the sample out. There's an electrode on the left side of that cell, and there's a corresponding electrode on the right side of the cell. You're seeing the window where the light uh, goes, the laser goes in on the lower right. But the cell has the shape of a horizontal trough that's 10 millimeters by 1.7 by 1.7, so it's quite small, and that helps suppress convection. Reduces the temperature difference by having thermally conductive electrodes in windows. So we can operate over the wide temperature range from 4 to 70. And because we have this parallelism, we make our measurements very quickly. And often we can make measurements even as low as one second uh, for large particles and maybe 30 seconds for small particles or nanoparticles. But that means we can make our measurement before convection develops. So the other problem I talked about with high salt is the evolution of gas. And so okay, if we have a cell where we make the volume quite small, the gas that's emitted is going to be right in our measurement volume. The volume of the gas is proportional to the amount of current we flow through the cell times the time. If you have high current, you have a lot of gas. So is there anything you can do about it? Well. The answer is yes. I'm going to appeal to William Henry. Now, you might wonder who William Henry is, so I'll remind you. He formulated Henry's Law in 1803, and he pointed out that when you pressurize a fluid solution, you can force gas into solution. And this is why when you get a soda can, the carbon dioxide is in solution, but when you pull a tab and you reduce the pressure, it comes out of solution in the form of bubbles. But we're going to invert that. We're going to pressurize the solution to force the gas that's evolved on the electrodes to stay in solution. So we're not going to get bubbles. And it's even nicer than that, is that if you inject a sample and you have a little micro bubble that's gotten injected with it, as soon as you pressurize, that micro bubble gets crushed out. And what I mean by pressure, we're going to use uh, roughly 30 bar. So a bubble will shrink by a factor of 30 from atmospheric to uh, a pressure of 30 bar. This allows you to make measurements with higher fields without fear of bubbles being formed. The way we do this is we apply, um, well, there's several ways of doing it, but the one is this technique where we take a pressurized gas cylinder. We have a little accessory that has five ports. You eject the sample in. It goes into the cell. 
you valve off the cell, you pressurize the 30 bar, you make your measurement, and then when you're done, you do pressurize and flush the sample out, and you can go to the next sample. And this is automated, so you can do this uh, continuously, one sample after another. One question I get a lot is, well, does pressurizing the sample change the mobility? And the short answer is no. The pressures that we're applying, about 30 bar, are not enough to change the, uh, the mobility. There is work, for example, with proteins where people have looked at unfolding transitions at thousands of bar, but at 30 bar, there's basically no change. And so the point of this view graph is a, to demonstrate that. We took a polystyrene latex sphere. We measured it five times at each pressure, and the, low, the horizontal axis is the applied pressure. And you can see you can basically get the same mobility at all applied pressures. So even though we're pressurizing the cell, we're not changing the samples that were measured. And that's because 30 bar is not a high pressure in terms of making structural changes to the molecules. So this is what it looks like in practice. So this is a measurement of Pierce BSA, and this is at physiological saline of 150 millimolar sodium chloride. And in this case, we pressurized 18 bar. We got a beautiful mobility measurement of, of minus 1.28 MBUs and a size of 3.8 nanometers. You can go to even higher conductivity. This was a conductivity of 17 millisiemens per centimeter, and you still get good data. So let me talk now a little bit about automation. Making mobility measurements is great, um, but if you have to do it one at a time or if you have to clean a cell between every sample, it can be quite tedious. And so one thing that we've worked really hard on is how to make measurements of tens or hundreds of samples. And so here is the way an automation setup looks like. We have a chromatography pump a standard auto sampler. We, since we have a flow cell, we can inject the sample into the cell, and we can uh, have a, a back pressure regulator or an impedance on the exit of the cell to help pressurize it while we're flowing. But we're going to use a standard chromatography system without any columns to just inject the sample. And because we have this ability to, to have a flow cell, we can flow in from the front panel. So you flow in, you need a fairly large amount of sample because you want to completely fill the cell and actually overfill the cell several times to make certain you have a good plateau. So you need about 350, 500 microliters or so in order to do that. At the end of each injection, we stop the flow and we make our measurement. And the reason we stop the flow is because we want to make certain that the only motion is from electrophoretic migration. So here's an example of how that works. I call this Goldilocks and the three little proteins. So what I have here is a measurement of three proteins. We have lysozyme, BSA, and IgG near its isoelectric point. And the protocol is the following. We flush solvent in to make certain that we've washed the old solvent, the sample out. We inject the sample. We wait for the cell to fill. We stop the flow. We pressurize. And we make our measurement. And then we have on the horizontal axis the measured size. And on the vertical axis, we have the measured mobility and MBU. And you can see that you get three isolated regions because the lysozyme is positively charged and small. The BSA is negatively charged and intermediate. And the IgG is relatively large. I mean, five nanometers is relatively large. And in this case, it was near its isoelectric point, so it was effectively zero. And then we repeat it. So we did this more than once. And you can see in two runs, they show no evidence of carryover. So you can do this as, as much as you want. So we have the ability to use a standard auto sampler to make automated, unattended measurements. So let me talk a little bit about applications. Um, so here's an application that one of our customers uh, wanted us to demonstrate. And this was to look at aluminum particles that are used as vaccine adjuvants. Now, these are commonly added to vaccines to enhance immunogenicity. And they wanted to measure the mobility to determine how it's going to affect the stability of the formulation, but there was a problem. And the problem is that the redox potential of the aluminum is quite small. It's around minus 1.6 volts or 1.7 volts. So if you apply a voltage that's much higher than this, you're going to uh, reduce that aluminum and damage the sample. And so the question is, could we make measurements without damaging the sample? So the protocol to demonstrate this looks something like this. We're going to try a whole bunch of different voltages, one and a half, two, two and a half, and six volts. For each sample, for or each iteration, we're going to inject a fresh sample, make a series of measurements, and the series of measurements were five measurements, each of which were five seconds long. 
wait a minute, make another five measurements of five seconds, wait a minute, make another five measurements of five seconds, and then change the voltage and do it over again. And this is what we got. So on the bottom here, we have, well, on the left axis, we have the mobility in MBU. On the horizontal axis, we have the measurement time. You see three bunches of samples. That's the first uh, set of five measurements. There's a one-minute pause, the second set of five measurements, a one-minute pause, and the third set of five measurements. And as long as we have a small voltage shown by the diamonds of one and a half volts, then all three bunches give the exact same mobility. If we uh, look at two volts, which is the red squares, same thing. But something strange happens when we get the two and a half volts, the diamonds. The first batch of measurements look good, but the second batch of measurements show a change. And they actually go from positive to negative, and the third batch is negative because we've reduced our sample. And of course, if we do it with six volts, then even the first batch is bad. But here's an example of making a measurement at the wrong voltage or too high a voltage damages the sample. So the lessons that you can learn from this is that too high an applied voltage will really change your sample, and you just don't know until you make a voltage study. Measuring too long, even the ones that looked good for the first set of five got damaged if you made measurements for too long. So the key is it's really important to measure quickly and with low voltage. And this is really one of the strengths of this MP-PALS technique, is by measuring rapidly, you can prevent damage. Now, my next case study is another example from um, Imaginicity. Um, it was one of our customers was looking at heparin, and heparin is a super highly charged biomolecule. It's highly negatively charged, and it's commonly used as an anticoagulant. And one of the things that can go wrong when you use it as a pharmaceutical preparation is you can get immune reaction to heparin aggregates. And this is called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And the question was, what's driving this mechanism? Why some people have an immune reaction and other people do not? And the hypothesis was that even though heparin is highly negatively charged, that a protein, a blood protein, PF4, which is positively charged, is attracted to it binds to the heparin, and partially uh, neutralizes the surface charge. And because it's negatively charged, it's stable, but as soon as you eliminate some of the surface charge, it can aggregate, and then you cause an immune system to the large aggregates. And so the experiment consisted of looking at mixtures of protamine and heparin and looking at how the mobility changes as we change the stoichiometric ratio. So here's a ratio of one-to-one, -one, both at low concentrations of 0.1 mg per mil, and you can see that you get the highly negatively charged heparin value, minus 4 MBU. If you reduce the amount of heparin in this mixture, so you have more of the protamine, it switches to positively charged, and you'll notice the V graph is now going up. Well, if at one mixture it's positive and another mixture is negative, at some point it's zero. And so here is an example of measuring the mobility of these samples as a function of the heparin fraction. So on the horizontal axis, on the right is pure heparin. On the left is zero heparin. Um, when we have on the lower right, we have the pure heparin values or nearly pure values. We have strong negative charge. And on the left, they're positively charged. And of course, as advertised, somewhere in the middle, we get zero net charge at about a stoichiometry of two to one. And at this point, the stabilization that you get from being charged goes away. And now they can aggregate, and this aggregate can induce an immune reaction. Now, for the purposes of the talk, I've been stressing you have to stop flow. And the conventional wisdom is that if you don't stop flow, the motion through the cell is going to completely dominate the tiny motion that's generated as a result of the electric field. But we started wondering, well, what happens if we don't stop flow? The conventional wisdom is this is a really bad idea because the motions we're getting are micrometers per second, and the flow through the cell can be 100 times that. But the key point is if you look at the flow through the cell, as shown by this red arrow that goes from front to back, the fluid comes in through one of the fluid fittings on the top, it goes through the optical channel, and then out the second fluid fitting. That flow is perpendicular to the electric field. The electric field is shown in blue. And the MP-PALS only measures the component of the velocity along the electric field. So because they're perpendicular, in theory, it doesn't see the flow through the cell. Now, of course, you're never perfectly perpendicular, but 
you know, we do our, our best to try to make them so. But if you have a residual uh, small angle between the two flows, you'll get an optical phase that instead of changing with the field will grow with time. But the key point is it doesn't change with the field. And if it doesn't flip with the field reversal, then like the diffusion term, we can separate out the part of the measurement that does change with the field from that that doesn't. So we can determine what fraction of the signal is coming from flow through the cell and what fraction of the signal is coming from the uh, mobility in the direction of the field. So what that means is that we can make measurements while the sample is flowing through the cell. That means we can use it as an online detector, and this is really new. So to test this thing out, we decided to try it with standard size exclusion chromatography. So this is the setup. We have a pump. We have an autosampler. We inject the sample onto a column, and then we go into an analysis chain. I'm only showing the Mobius, uh, the mobility detector, but you could have UV absorption. You could have static light scattering. You could have viscometry. You could have any analysis chain, and then you go to waste. And so this is the set setup, and this is the protocol we used to test it. We decided to take three different proteins, thyroglobulin with a molecular weight of 660 kilodalton, BSA with a molecular weight of 66 kilodaltons, so about 10 times smaller, and carbonic anhydrase with a molecular weight of 30 to 50. It's slightly polydispersed. And we made batch measurements, and you get perf beautiful data for each of the batch measurements. And then we took the data, uh, the samples, we mixed them, and we put them onto a chromatography column and separated them out by SEC. So we're going to compare the individual measurements in batch to the SEC values. We also did a third experiment where we injected each one individually on the SEC. So what does it look like? Well, it looks pretty good, actually. Here we have the mobility on the vertical axis, time, the elution time of the chromatography elution on the horizontal axis, overlaid, the continuous trace is a refractive index detector, which is measuring the concentration coming out of the sample, and the dots are the measured mobility. And you can see the thyroglobulin, which actually has a very high molecular weight at a fairly low concentration in the sample, had a very large negative mobility. The BSA was intermediate around minus 1, and the carbonic anhydrase was about minus 0.4. Now, because we fractionated the sample, we have a measure of the mobility and the concentration at every single point in time. So we can take this a step further, and we can compute the mobility spectrum. What fraction of the sample has a given mobility? So here is the mobility spectrum, where the vertical axis is the weight fraction, or the percentage of the sample that has a mobility between, say, minus 1.6 and minus 1.5. So this left peak corresponds to the thyroglobulin, the middle peak corresponds to the mobility of the BSA, and the right peak corresponds to the carbonic anhydrase. But this is a pretty high-resolution spectrum gotten from doing size exclusion chromatography in conjunction with mobility detection. Now, there are measurements that people have done in the past where with a batch sample, if, you, if it's polydispersed, you can separate out the individual species, but only with extremely low resolution. And in fact, it's, although there are papers showing that it's possible, it's rarely done because usually you have to have things that are so widely separated in mobility that you can, sep that you can see them as individual peaks. But when you combine, combine it with the power of chromatography to fractionate the sample, suddenly you get high-resolution spectra. And so that's very exciting. So in summary, on this experiment, we have the batch measurement, and we have the online individual injections, and we have the online mixed. And you'll notice the mobility that we got from the batch thyroglobulin was a little bit different than what we got from the online. But the two online measurements agreed with themselves very well. And that's because the, the batch had some aggregates in it that we fractionated out. And you can see that. If you look at the RH, you'll see the RH was slightly higher than the RH that you got from the fractionated values. The BSA had very few aggregates. It's a nice pure sigma BSA sample. So in fact, all three of the mobilities agree quite well. And the CA had the same sort of problem. But this shows one of the strengths of being able to uh, combine size exclusion chromatography and the phase analysis light scattering. You can fractionate out aggregates. You can get a spectrum.
you automatically dialyze the sample because if you have a different salt content in your sample, by the time it goes through the column, it's done a solvent exchange, and now the sample is in the mobile phase. You can automatically pressurize the system by just simply putting a back pressure regulator or even just a, a flow restrictor on the exit of the instrument, and that pressurizes and eliminates bubbles. And of course, every single measurement that we're making is a fresh sample that's coming off the column. So any electrolysis products are flushed to waste. That's all well and good for molecules, but we can do the same thing for particles. So here is an example of coupling the phase analysis light scattering with field flow fractionation. It looks very similar to the size exclusion chromatography. We have a pump, an auto sampler, but now we have a different fractionator, and this is the field flow fractionation, and again, we can go through our analysis chain. I'll make a brief excursion into field flow fractionation. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the technique is you have a field that's shown vertically that pushes the sample against an accumulation wall. In this case, it's an a ultrafiltration membrane. And so big particles are pushed firmly against the membrane. But there's also diffusion that tends to lift the particles off the membrane. So the left peak here is basically large particles where they're mostly accumulated on the membrane. The right peak is a small particle where there's a smaller force pushing it onto the membrane and there's more diffusion. So on average, it sticks further out into the bulk. Both of them have the highest concentration right on the membrane, but on average, the small particles are sticking further out into the, into the fluid. If you then combine this with a cross flow that sweeps across the channel, the fluid on the wall doesn't move, and the fluid in the bulk has a, a shear. So the things that stick further out in the bulk move downstream faster, and that means the small particles come out, and then the intermediate size, and finally the large ones. This is inverted from the normal elution order that you get from size exclusion chromatography. But the key point is by changing the cross flow and the, the field, you can tune this to either fractionate molecules or fractionate particles. And to demonstrate this, we took a mixture of three polystyrene latex spheres, 50 nanometer diameter, 100 nanometer diameter, and 200 nan nanometer diameter, and we fractionated them with FFF. And on the left axis, we have the mobility as measured of each sample. On the right axis, we have the size of each sample. And the size is the hydrodynamic radius. It's half of the diameter. And so the 50 nanometer has a hydrodynamic radius of 25. 100 nanometer had a hydrodynamic radius of 50. And the 200 had a hydrodynamic radius of 100, as shown in by the red. And we have the mobility of each one. And you can see the mobilities are quite different. So. In summary, we can do a whole bunch of really interesting experiments. We can do measurements very rapidly. We can measure proteins and nanoparticles at low voltage so we don't damage them. We can pressurize the system to suppress convection, to suppress electrolysis, to work with high salts. And we can automate the system and set up an auto sample and just have it run unattended for large numbers of samples. And finally, and probably the most uh, interesting for me, is that we can couple this device to online fractionation methods, size exclusion chromatography for molecules, field flow fractionation for molecules and particles. And you can combine this with a stack of other analytical instruments and go from make measurement of mobility, hydrodynamic radius, if you add light scatter, Rank light scattering, you can get molecular weight, you can get radius of gyration. If you add a viscometer, you can get intrinsic viscosity, and the, the number of opportunities goes on. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you found this informative, and I'd be happy to take some questions. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, we do have some questions already, and a reminder to our audience, you can ask your questions using the Q&A uh, box on your screen. To start off with, um, I think this question came in with the test about the aluminum, was it aluminum nanoparticles? Were each voltage tested with fresh samples, or was the 1.5, 2.0, 2.56 volt sample done right after each other on the same sample? Oh, that's a good question. I, I was a little unclear on that. Um, so the way the protocol worked is the sample was injected in the cell, and then the first batch of measurements was made, and then the pause, 
the second batch of measurements were made, and then another pause. But all of the measurements with uh, a given voltage were with the same sample. We flushed the sample out when we switched to the next voltage. So all of the 1.5 uh, volt measurements were with one uh, sample. All the two volt measurements were with fresh sample, and so on. And the idea there was to show that even when the first batch was good, if you just waited, the damage that had occurred um, could accumulate. Uh, also, I was a little bit uh, unclear about that. I kept talking about reducing the, uh, the aluminum, in fact, or oxidizing it. But that was a good question. All right. Uh, next question. How might you need to adjust the method to measure highly scattering particles like titanium dioxide? Yeah, so um, when I, in the talk, I, I was a little bit unclear about the size range that you could measure and the concentration ranges. Um, the, of course, there's two measurements that are going on simultaneously. The, there's the dynamic light scattering, and the dynamic light scattering has limits on, uh, if you have too turbid of a sample, you get what's called multiple scattering, and it'll, it'll affect the measurement of the size. Um, the, the PALS is much more forgiving in that sense. You can look at fairly concentrated solutions. You can even look at very large particles. Um, we were able to measure particles up to like tens of, of microns. Um, but when you get too turbid, since we have a fairly long path length to try to look uh, to get good sensitivity for low concentrations, if it's too turbid, then you run into uh, problems with uh, not getting enough light through. Now, that can be fixed by using a cell that has a shorter path. Um, I didn't go into all the, the various cell options, but the flow cell is the, the primary cell, but we also have a quartz cuvette that has a path that's one-third the length, and you can look at correspondingly higher concentrations when you do that. Um, also, with very turbid samples, you tend to do better by just diluting them down, um, but I, I hope that answers the question. All right, and then can you estimate the surface charge on the nanoparticle by measuring the zeta potential? So, yes. Um, I talked primarily about um, mobility because that's the primary measurement. The zeta potential is derived from the mobility. It is, it's not an independent measurement. In fact, the mobility is what we're measuring. Um, but to get the zeta potential, you have to apply some additional assumptions. And I talked about those charges that are bound on the surface. Um, there's, there's really three different limits that people uh, talk about when they're converting the mobility to zeta potential. One is when the particle is so large that that, uh, that layer of adsorbed um, charged particles is small. Um, that's called the, uh, the Smolikowski limit. And in that, the, there's a simple relationship between uh, the measured mobility and the, uh, and the zeta potential. In the other limit, where the particle is very small compared to that um, adsorbed uh, layer of charges, you get a different number, a different relationship. But it varies by about a factor of one and a half. In between, if you know the ionic strength, there is this uh, so-called Henry's equation, which interpolates between these two limits and gives you the, the zeta potential. Um, but you also then have to tell, you, uh, tell the software what the ionic strength is. And it's fairly easy to do. But in both the Smolikowski and the Huckel uh, limit, you don't have to know the ionic strength. But we're not, um, the, my, the, my point is that we're measuring mobility. And that's why I tend to talk about mobility. But in fact, more commonly referred to in the literature is the zeta potential, but it's derived directly from the mobility. It's not an independent measure. Um, OK, and we have another question on the nanoparticles. This one asking, um, can you do precision measurements of polymer-coated magnetic nanoparticles? Well, um, I've not worked with these, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Um, one of the, uh, the questions would be, um, are these aggregating due to magnetic interactions? Um, I think the answer is yes. We've made measurements of uh, coated uh, polystyrene latex spheres. We've made measurements of um, other particles that are composites. Um, but there's no reason why you can't. One a nice thing about the, uh, the materials was we tried to make uh, all the flow path out of inert materials. So the only wetted materials are peak, um, uh, platinum for the electrodes, uh, CalRes for the seals, and fused silica for the windows. So it gives us a very wide range of both uh, pH and, um, and chemical, wide chemical compatibility. You can do both aqueous and organic uh, solvents. And a protein question. Can you measure the mobility of fluorescently labeled proteins? Yeah, that's a good one. So the answer is yes. 
Um, but there's a challenge. And the challenge is, uh, there's, I talked uh, early on about two different wavelengths, a green and a red. The green is at 532 nanometers, and if they're fluorescently tagged, you'll often excite um, strong fluorescence. Um, and that will mess up the dynamic light scattering, because you'll get this very large baseline that, that doesn't have to do with relative motion. Um, the reason we have two different wavelengths is so that you can, for strongly fluorescent particles, you can use a red where you don't excite the fluorescence. Um, you can also use fluorescence blocking filters. Um, we've done that as well. Um, so the answer is yes, you can make measurements, but there's some subtleties involved in getting uh, the best quality data. And that's why we wanted to have different wavelengths and um, because we also know that not just fluorescence, you run into similar problems with absorption. And we have a couple of questions regarding uh, media. How about measurement of electrophoretic mobility in apolar media? Yeah, so I, I sort of touched that on that briefly. Um, most people do measurements in um, in aqueous, uh, but you can also make measurements of mobility in um, organics. So we've done measurements in uh, toluene um, and in uh, alcohol. Um, you use much higher fields because they're basically a dielectric and they're screening a lot of the applied field. So the typical um, voltages that you would apply for an aqueous uh, is maybe two to five, five volts. You saw from that, that study of the, uh, the different aluminum particles. When you go to organics, you want to use much higher voltages. And the instrument will go all the way up to 100 volts. Um, the thing you have to be careful about is um, uh, if you get a little bit of adsorbed moisture, um, then you can electrolyze the, uh, the solvent and produce bubbles. If it's very dry, then you don't have that problem. You can go for the very high voltages. But the short answer is yes. Um, the mobilities uh, tend to be a lot smaller, but you can make measurements in, uh, in organic solvents as well. All right. And can you use the technique for nano emulsions containing acid? So yes. Um, like I said, we tried to make uh, the materials that are wetted um, have a wide range of chemical compatibility. It's quite a challenge to make an instrument where you know you don't know exactly what range of solvents people are going to use. But by limiting the, the wetted materials, oh, I, I, I forgot to mention, there's one other wetted material. There's uh, titanium, but it's, uh, it's oxidized titanium. But the chemical compatibility is quite uh, wide. So there's, there's no problem with looking at um, strong acids or strong bases. Um, I think at some point, uh, strongly uh, reducing media like amines uh, could be a problem. Okay, we've got a couple questions here that, that are somewhat related. One person asking about what approximate volume you need for automated mobility measurements, and also someone asking about minimum sample concentration. Okay, so the, in the experiment that we used the autosampler to inject, we tended to be very conservative. We wanted to overfill the cell. The cell has a, uh, the flow cell has a volume, internal volume of 180 microliters which is fairly large for most analytical instruments. In order to make certain that you've filled the cell and gotten a nice plateau, we typically went um, so 300 to 500 microliters, which is a fair bit. Um, that could be reduced um, if you're willing to, to push the limits, but we were being very conservative. Um, in terms of concentration, the, the, the dy dynamic light scattering and the uh, PALS measurements have different limits in terms of uh, concentrations and sizes. The rule of thumb is because the small molecules and nanoparticles scatter much less light, when you go to um, small, uh, low molecular weight, you need higher concentrations. So we have measured, um, I'll, just, I'll talk a little bit about the size limits. For the dynamic light scattering, we can go from uh, uh, RH of about 0.2 nanometers up to well above a micrometer. And for the PALs, we can go from about one nanometer up to tens of micrometers. And again, at the low concentrations, you have to, or the low molecular weight end, you have to go to higher concentrations. But for example, one of our QC tests is we put lysozyme in as a, as a check standard, and that's got a molecular weight of 14.4 kilodaltons, and we can measure that at, at um, one mg per mil. And uh, we can measure it below that, but we guarantee that each measurement, each instrument can measure it at that concentration. And of course, as the particles get bigger, then you need less and less concentration. OK, we also have someone asking about opaque samples like inks. Would those need to be diluted? Yes. Um, so in that case, it, it depends on if it's opaque at the laser wavelengths that we're using. 
but uh, very likely you would have to dilute it, uh, the samples. Um, you run into this problem with turbidity. Um, if you don't get any light through, the uh, PALS uses the forward scattered light in order to make the measurement. And if it's very opaque, um, you might not get very much light through it. And uh, for most people, diluting is not a problem. Concentrating is more of a problem. But if it was really quite turbid or quite strongly absorbing, there could be a problem there. But um, for most people, diluting is not a problem. And also on the sample end, uh, what about viscosity? Are there limits to how viscous a sample can be? Um, so yes, there is. We, we did a test where we wanted to measure for very high concentrations for a customer who was uh, looking at pharmaceutical formulations. And they wanted to know, could we measure uh, at hundreds of mg per mil? And so we had, a, um, I think it was an antibody uh, drug where um, we were measuring all the way from you know, 0 0.1 0 mg per mil all the way up to uh, 20 mg per mil. And at that end, it gets quite viscous. One of the parameters that goes into the analysis is the solvent viscosity. So in principle, uh, there's no reason why you can't look at very viscous samples. But in practice, the mobility goes down when you have very viscous samples. Because remember, it's an interplay of the driving field and the, uh, the frictional force that slows them down. If you have a very viscous sample, the friction force gets quite large and the mobility gets smaller and smaller. So yes, you can do it in principle, but in practice, uh, if you get to you know many uh, more than say five or ten centipoise, then the mobility is going to get quite small, and it'll get more challenging to measure it. All right, and uh, another media question: What about measurements in seawater? Okay, so that's a highly salty solution. Um, that's the pressurization I was talking about. So yes, you can make measurements. Um, in highly salty uh, solutions. The, uh, I didn't show uh, one of the examples where we had um, uh, the, uh, the, the ionic strength was at 56 millisiemens per centimeter. Um, so the short answer is yes, but you have to pressurize if you want to uh, not evolve gas. All right, we've got time for a couple more questions, and then we'll need to wrap up. Uh, one of them, one, one person would like to know, is there a single instrument that gives both hydrodynamic radius and PI? OK, so this instrument, um, to get PI, you have to prepare a series of uh, different pHs to, uh, and then measure the mobility as a function of pH. And you can do that by coupling it to an autosampler that generates the, uh, the different, um, uh, uh, well, an autosampler so you can inject different uh, pHs. And then you make the measurement of the mobility as a function of pH and find where the mobility goes to 0. And so this instrument, with when you couple it to an autosampler and you have a range of samples, we'll give you both RH and PI. All right, and our last question, is there an effect of particle shape on the conducted measurements and results? For example, would there be a difference between gold spheres and other shapes? So OK, I didn't talk about um, metal, metal nanoparticles, although that is a, a, a big application for this instrument. Um, what we get is an ensemble average of all of the orientations of all of the particles. So if they're, if they're non-spherical, then you're going to get an average of all the different um, orientations that the particles may take. Um, the big problem with, say, gold nanoparticles is, um, is that they have strong absorptions. And they're one of the reasons uh, I was talking about earlier of going to different wavelengths. Um, we had a, an example of a gold nanoparticle that a customer measured where at six uh, five, or 532 nanometers, they were getting um, very strong uh, absorption. When they went to the red at uh, 640 nanometers, then the absorption uh, went away, and they got accurate results. Um, but we don't see any shape dependence, uh, because it's a, a batch measurement, and you, you're basically averaging over all of the orientations. All right, well, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you again, Steve, for your presentation. Thank you, participants, for being a great audience. Be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for information on the next edition of CNEN webinars. Thank you, ON24, for technology and production services. And thank you, Wyatt Technology, for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For CNEN webinars, I'm Jillian Kemsley. Goodbye. <laughs>